Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for more coffee. In philosophy, uh, this is part two of what I think is probably going to be a three part uh, version of this expanded uh, edition of my talk on the uh, the on austro libertarian themes in three Prague authors, which I I hope to get about uh, around to writing up the full and detailed version of uh, at some point and publishing it somewhere. Um, uh, but uh, in the meantime, I want to share this expanded version uh, with you. Uh, so part one was on Karl Chopek. Originally, I thought I was going to do all three parts in one, but it turns out that when I'm not limited by time, I will take all the time I need. Um, and so that expanded, you know, that expanded into uh, entire episodes worth. Um, no good. I need more. Need more. Uh, episodes since my my backlog is running a little thin um because i haven't had time i haven't had time to do any more interviews since the last one uh i've got several people who are sort of tentatively down for doing interviews but i just haven't had time uh to do them um and you know, whereas this since it doesn't require interacting with anyone else i could just do it with this anytime that I, I fit in um but I'll be going back to interviews. I've got, you know, I've got several people lined up. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, part one was on uh, Karl Chopek, uh, one of the major uh, prog writers of uh, the um, the first third of the twentieth uh, uh, century, roughly. Um, there's plenty more to say about Chopek that I didn't say that I covered more in the. Uh, uh, paper, but I think I hope that what I said about Chopic was uh, enough to uh, intrigue you and get you interested in um, in tracking down more of his work. As I said, a lot of his work is is out of print in English, but not all of it. Um, so, uh, um, in this video, I'm going to talk about Kafka. Uh, Franz Kafka is the most well known of these three authors. He also wrote in German, not Czech. Um, which uh, was probably helped to make his work uh, more accessible uh, to translation. Um, it's a lot more people can read, uh, can read and translate German than can read and translate Czech. Although uh, most of Kafka's works, I mean, sorry, most of Chopik's works are uh, in English translation, not all of them, um, but they're harder to find. Whereas Kafka's works you can find like, in many multiple uh, Editions, and he's sort of a a favorite of the uh, you know of literary scholars uh, to a degree that um, you know, the Chopik and Hasek uh, aren't, and I really think that all three of these writers deserve uh, uh, a lot more uh, attention than they get. But anyway, uh, I'm going to talk about Kafka now, so I'm going to go back to. Uh, our slides. Um, okay, so, uh, and this is the section of the talk that, um, of the section, this is the part of the slides that is the most revised compared to, uh, the, I revised for the um, Prague Conference of Political Economy, uh, the most compared to the version I gave at the uh, uh, Mises Institute, um, like seven seven ish years before that. Uh, so Kafka also I mean, often presents his work often presents individuals who are in the grip of some kind of incomprehensible bureaucracy. And that's probably the thing that Kafka is the most famous for. Um, and one dispute among uh, readers of Kafka is is are we supposed to take this as a literal political meaning? Uh, you know, is this a critique of existing political institutions? Or is this some kind of metaphor for the human condition, in which case it's really sort of a metaphysical description, not a critique. Also, there's some passages that seem to condemn this power system. There are others that seem to portray it as justified. How do you reconcile those? I have a, a view about that, which I'm not gonna be able to defend in full um, in this uh, presentation, 
probably not going to be able to defend it in full in the um, in the final paper version either. But at least I will have more to say. But I will, you know, I will gesture in the direction uh, of it. Uh, now, Rebecca West, in her book *The Court and the Castle*, actually interprets Kafka as a defender of bureaucracy, on the basis of those passages that uh, seem to say that. Um, uh, that seem to re represent this bureaucratic power structure as justified. So there's some passages that seem to. Um, but there are other passages that seem to go the other way. So for example, uh, Kafka himself, who worked as, you know, worked as a bureaucrat, uh, he, you know, he worked for this um, insurance office and he uh, used to say, uh, how humble these people are. They come to beg at our feet instead of taking the building by storm and stripping it bare. No. So that doesn't suggest that he saw the bureaucrats as a, as a great thing. Um, uh, you know, I like Rebecca West and I think the Court in the Castle is really an interesting book, but I think that her, um, her interpretation of, uh, of Kafka is, you know, is screwy. There's also an interpretation of Hamlet in there, which I think is also screwy. Um, but she's a great writer, even when her interpretations are screwy. She's always worth reading. Um, my mother wrote her thesis on uh, Mary Wollstonecraft and Rebecca West, uh, which is sort of an interesting, um, it's an interesting combo. Um, uh, anyway, then there's also this this line, and there's some dispute about the authenticity of this line because it was recollected by someone who may not be completely reliable. But anyway, uh, allegedly Kafka said, the anarchists all sought thanklessly to realize human happiness. I understood them, but I was unable to continue marching alongside them for long. So that suggests that he was marching alongside them for a while and he had some kind of anarchist sympathies, that he was sympathetic to them, but that you know, he couldn't you know, be completely down with them, but um, doesn't say exactly why. Um, you know, so figuring out where Kafka stands is often a cryptic matter. There's also a, a, a line um, in some, one of his private notes where he's just written, don't forget Kropotkin, which might be, you know, pointing to some, um, you know, some important concern about Kropotkin as, as, as someone whose ideas should be remembered. Though some people suggested it might just mean, they might just be short for don't forget to return the Kropotkin books to the library or something like that. And we don't know what it means. It's, um, uh, you know, in terms of sort of cryptic one line notes, it, uh, I guess it goes, you know, it can take its place beside um, Nietzsche's one line uh, thing scribbled uh, on a piece of uh, note paper. I have forgotten my umbrella in quotation marks. Um, no one knows what he means by that, although I didn't stop Jerry Da from writing an entire book on it, um, which actually is sort of enjoyable to read uh, in a strange way. Um, uh, but anyway, so um, the book is called Spurs. Uh, I think I believe that's the one, which is just what you would call a book that's about Nietzsche forgetting his umbrella, isn't it? Uh, Jerry Da. Um, some of Jerry Dow is worth reading. I think the grammatology is worth reading. I think that uh, he becomes more and more self-indulgent over time. But grammatology, I recommend. Spurs is fairly self-indulgent. Uh, I don't know if I'd recommend it exactly, but uh, I just sort of enjoyed seeing the insanity of it. But grammatology, I think, actually makes some valuable points. But anyway, this, that's definitely a digression from anything going on here. Uh, by the way, that's a... a uh, that's a photo of a of a sculpture of Kafka in Prague, and each of those individual those individual slices move around relative to each other. So it's constantly displaying different, uh, uh, you know, different aspects. It's in constant motion. Uh, so I've seen that in Prague. It's uh, pretty cool. Anyway, so I've got this interpretation of Kafka, um, which uh, you know, in the written version, I would hope to defend more fully, though I don't know how fully I can do it that a lot of Kafka stories are intended to be read on two different levels, on a theological level and a political level. And that the theological meaning and the political meaning are at odds with each other. They go in different directions. So on the theological level, the elusive and incomprehensible authority that, that is the 
so much so much the theme of many of uh, his writings is meant to represent the inscrutable justice of God, and so it's been justified. Now, some of his early writings, the authority that's danger is not an elusive or incomprehensible or distant one. It's a very visceral, in-your-face one, and seems to represent his clashes with his father. Um, uh, but over time, who moves to this more idea of this distant, elusive authority you can never get your hands on, um, which definitely does not describe his relationship with his father. His father was present, all too present in his life and mind. Um, but uh, so, so I think it stands for God. And to that extent, uh, you know, the bureaucracy is, uh, is justified. But, but I think on another level, that same bureaucracy is also describing what goes on in the human world. And because that doesn't have a divine sanction, that's condemned. So I think that's why Rebecca West gets you know, I think she misreads Kafka in seeing him as a defender of bureaucracy because she sees the passages where he seems to be treating this as justified. But I think that's where he's treating it as the as the the human condition based on the elusive divine justice, which we can't legitimately question. But I think that when you get a reproduction of that same kind of elusive and incomprehensible authority at the human level, uh, that doesn't represent divine justice. That's just humans doing shady stuff. And so I don't think that Kafka has the same kind of reverence for that. Um, so that's why I think that Kafka's works really are being, he really is operating on two levels here, which again is kind of like what I said about Chopek in the previous video, that um, uh, you know, what, that both the robots in RUR and the newts in War with the Newts uh, operate as metaphors at more than one level. They are, they are sympathetic. They can be, they stand for certain sympathetic things, but they also stand for certain things to be wary of. Um, you know, Tropic and Kafka are both complicated writers. Uh, they don't, um, you know, they're not writing, uh, you know, they're not writing simple stories. Um, uh, anyway, so that's my reading of Kafka. I think that's what's going on. So here's an example. So he has this, um, uh, the story in the penal colony um, where there's this punishment device that carves written messages into the prisoner's body in order to instruct him. Uh, but in the story, the device malfunctions, leaving the body butchered and the message indecipherable. So I think that on a theological level, this is about the inscrutability of divine justice. And there's a, um, there's a nice article by Peter Neumeyer defending this interpretation in detail called Do Not Teach Kafka's in the Penal Colony. And the reason he takes that, the reason he gives that advice, you know, this is advice to teachers and professors, don't, don't teach this, don't assign this story. His argument is this story is about systematic parallel, it has systematic parallels with aspects of Christian theology. Today's students don't know shit about Christian theology, therefore they're not gonna understand the story. But I think it's, you know, I think it's a strange moral. First of all, you know, there are plenty of students who uh, who do understand um, uh, uh, Christian theology. Uh, a lot of philosophy majors at Auburn are are intending to go on to divinity studies. Um, in fact, one of our best uh, majors is now uh, uh, now placed at uh, Yale Divinity School. Um, so we've got plenty of we've got plenty of students who can understand this stuff. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're not all the uncultured morons that Neumeyer seems to envisioning. But second, you know, if they don't understand the, the Christian theological references in the um, uh, in the story, then, uh, you know, if you're teaching it, you explain them. Um, there's also an interesting question why so many of Kafka's references seem to be Christian, given that his own background was Jewish and not Christian. Um, but of course, that's true of uh, a lot of Jewish writers who seem to be in love with Christian uh, metaphors uh, and analogies and, and uh, how much this actually implies a, uh, uh, you know, uh, any kind of actual commitment to Christianity isn't always clear. I mean, Leonard Cohen would be uh, an example. His, um, his songs and his poems are filled with Christian imagery. Does that mean he was tempted by Christianity? 
I mean, um, I mean he's, he's sort of tempted in various directions. He was a very temptable man, um, including Buddhism, of course. Uh, you know, I don't know what to say about Leonard Cohen. Um, uh, except you should remember him because he brought your groceries in. Um, but anyway, um, uh, so I, I think that apart from this weird moral that you shouldn't teach this work, as opposed to saying that you should teach it and explain the Christian references. Uh, I think Noam Meyer makes a very strong case that that that, that work and you know and relatedly a number of other of Kafka's works really have a theological meaning and that these you know this uh, device is not being condemned at the theological level. It's uh, talking about the inscrutability of divine justice. Um, but I also think that on a political level, it has the opposite meaning. It's about the pointless barbarism of punishment. And while well, I don't have it on the slide, uh, if you want to read an article about about uh, how to um, about defending the political rating, uh, there's an article by uh, Bill Dodd called "The Case for a Political Rating." You can find in the in the Cambridge Companion to Kafka. I think it's also very valuable. You know, so if you look at the people who are defending a theological rating and you look at the people who are defending a political rating, I think they both have a really strong case. And so that's part of the reason I think this is operating at both at both levels. And what's interesting is the way in which the levels are are opposite to each other. Um, you know, I don't think that Kafka is the only writer to do that kind of thing. I think there are a number of writers who are, who are using some kind of metaphor that operates at two levels and the levels are, and it has opposite valences in the two levels. I mean, um, uh, an example would be um, Seneca's version of Medea. Seneca has a play Medea that is based on Euripides play Medea, which in turn is based on the traditional legend of Medea. Um, but I think that uh, the Seneca's play of Medea is operating in two levels. One as a, um, one where Medea stands for the unbridled nature of passion that Stoicism, that Stoicism is supposed to curb and cure. And on another level, Medea stands for Stoicism itself and for the, um, the kind of uh, breaking of ordinary human ties that is that you have to do if you follow Stoicism. So that Medea is simultaneously a Stoic symbol and an anti-Stoic symbol, but operating at different levels. Um, not necessarily an anti-Stoic symbol, but sort of a, um, well, anyway, uh, if she, simultaneously, she simultaneously represents the evil that Stoicism is supposed to combat at one level, another level she represents the problematic, though in the end justified from Seneca's point of view, aspects of Stoicism itself. Um, anyway, that's my reading of, of Seneca's Medea. I don't know anyone else's given that interpretation. Um, I tried to convince Martha Nussbaum of it once or she wasn't buying it. Um, uh, I've never written that up. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever have a chance to write it up, but um, uh, anyway, you should read Seneca's Medea. Um, it's an interesting piece. Uh, uh, once again, a, a, a digression. That's the reason that these videos take so long as I keep talking about other things, but you know, uh, can't help it. Everything reminds me of something else. Um, anyway, so I think you know. So I think that Kafka stories operate in both levels. Uh, uh, on one hand, it's theologically about the human condition. On another level, it's political. It's political. Sometimes there's a you know there's a third level where it's about his relationship with his father. I wouldn't rule out there being other levels too because you know Kafka is a complicated guy. Uh, for the purposes of this uh, lecture, uh, if a lecture is exactly what this is, uh, this meandering thing, um, you'd think that if I have a if I have a PowerPoint, it should keep me on the straight and narrow uh, and keep me from wandering. But uh, you know. I cannot be restrained uh, from going up on digressions. But anyway, so the purposes of this lecture is about the Austro-Libertarian uh, uh, themes in Kafka. So it's, I'm going to focus on the political interpretation, where the bureaucracy is something that's that's condemned or questioned or uh, in some way problematic. Um, and I'm not going to focus on the theological level, but you should keep in mind that I, I think there is this theological level, and then it's moral often points in the exact opposite direction from the political one. Uh, all right, so uh, 
there's this um, there's this famous uh, story that gets told in the trial. In the trial, uh, in his novel, The Trial, there's this story that often gets excerpted separately, the story about the law and the lawkeeper, uh, where this guy goes, and by the way, this, this uh, clip is from um, in the April 1982 issue of Epic Illustrated, which was a giant size uh, comic book or magazine uh, the giant size ones didn't have to be bound by the Comics Code Authority, so they could uh, they could have more mature content. Um, a lot of those were black and white, but this one was actually in color, though this particular story isn't. Um, but through those, you know, through those giant size uh, Marvel comics, I you know, that was my introduction to you know everything from Arthur Conan Doyle to H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and Kafka. Um, so there was an adaptation of these two stories by Kafka, the um, Before the Law was one of them, and um, uh, and an Imperial Message uh, was the other. So anyway, this uh, this guy go wants to see go to the see the law. There's a he wants to go to, to see the law, and there's a door where you can go in and see the law, but there's a doorkeeper who's guarding it, and he says, you know, he's he, he says I cannot let you in at present. Uh, Perhaps in the future, it might be possible for you to be allowed in, but not at present. Um, and so the guy waits outside. He never tries to get past the guard. Uh, he thinks about it, but the guard says, I know you're thinking about trying to get past me, but you know, it can be very hard. Even if you do, you know, the next guard inside is you know, even scarier than I am. And the one after that is scarier yet. So the guy doesn't try to get you know, past him. And so he, he gets older and older as he sits there. He sometimes bribes the guard, and the bri guard says, "I'm only taking these from you to, to keep you from feeling you're leaving anything undone, uh, but you know I'm not going to let you in." And so over time, the um, the man shrinks and shrinks, or maybe the, the gatekeeper grows and grows, or anyway, as Kafka puts it, the difference in size between them has increased very much has increased very much to the man's disadvantage. Anyway, as he's about to die, he says. Everyone strives to reach the law. How does it happen then that in all these years, no one but me has ever begged for admittance? And the um, uh, the doorkeeper says, no one else could ever be admitted here. This gate was intended solely for you. And now I am going to shut it. Uh, so, you know, exactly how you interpret that, whether you go follow the theological interpretation or the bureaucratic interpretation, it's sort of puzzling, but anyway, there's, uh, there's this idea that this door was intended for you, but we, we never let you into it. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you never really tried to get past me, so uh, who knows what would have happened. Um, uh, anyway, I don't have a very certain interpretation of that, um, uh, of that passage. There are so many different ways you could interpret it, but really it's fascinating. Um, if in the last one I had a stamp, a, Czechoslo a Czechoslovak stamp, a Czechoslovensko stamp with um, Chopik on it. So here's one with uh, Kafka on it. And so Kafka is interested in the problem of information flow in bureaucratic hierarchies, which is also something that everyone from in the, in the libertarian movement broadly understood. Everyone from Robert Anton Wilson to Kevin Carson has written about. So in the trial, he writes, their remoteness kept the officials from being in touch with contemporary life. For the average case, they were excellently equipped. Such a case proceeded almost mechanically. Yet confronted with quite simple cases or particularly difficult cases, they were often utterly at a loss. They did not have any right understanding of human relations since they were confined day and night to the workings of their judicial system. Which is reminiscent a bit of what Chopik said about, you know, it might be very efficient if we were all on wheels, except you'd never be able to go anywhere where there wasn't already a path. Um, and Kafka seems to be making a similar point. Um, they're both talking about the, uh, well, I think they're both inspired by the, um, by the bureaucratic control of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which controlled Czechoslovakia for, uh, uh, for a long time. Um, uh, you know, there's this brief period of uh, independence before first the Nazis and then the communists uh, 
took over. Um, uh, um, because the, the period of, of, of Czechoslovak independence, uh, where, uh, where there was neither Austro-Hungarian rule nor Nazi rule nor communist rule, that's a, that was the you know, that's the period that um, that uh, you know the Chopek was a big fan of. And of course, Chopek was a friend of of Thomas Masaryk, the uh, uh, the president, uh, and so that for him that was like the the best period in in, uh, in Czech history. Uh, for Kafka, as someone of German background and Jewish background, he wasn't quite as jazzed about it. He was more of an outsider to that, too. I mean, he didn't like the other things either, and he wouldn't have liked uh, Nazism or communism if he had, you know, if he had lived to be subjected to them. Um, uh, but he uh, uh, he wasn't too. Um, he was less enthusiastic about. The period of Czechoslovak independence than Chavik was. By the way, if you look at that stamp, uh, uh, right behind his, right, right on either side of his head, you can see these tipping, um, uh, these tipping gravestones, which are um, with Hebrew letters on them. As that's a reference to the old, old Prague cemetery in the Jewish quarter, in um, uh, in Prague, which is. You know, not the Vishifrad Cemetery I showed you before, where Shopik is buried, but it's also not where Kafka is buried either. Kafka is buried in the, in a newer um, uh, cemetery uh, out on the outskirts of town. Uh, well, not the outskirts of town. That's the outskirts of town. If Prague's pretty big. The outskirts are pretty far away. It's you know, farther away from the center of things. Um, uh, that's a uh, anyway. I, I mentioned they're like you know. There are like multiple different cemeteries. So those three, the, the cemetery at Vishifrad, the Jewish cemetery, the old Jewish cemetery in the in the old ghetto quarter, and then the new Jewish cemetery out, um, out sort of past the main train station. Um, those are all really fascinating cemeteries in completely different ways. But anyway, they don't have the cemetery where he's buried. They have a cemetery that's sort of most emblematic of, uh, of the Jewish community. Um, uh, and then, of course, that's um, uh, that's uh, I think that's Prague Castle behind him uh, on the hill behind him. Um, doesn't look quite right, Prague Castle, but I think that's what it's supposed to be. Um, anyway, so uh, here I've got a pair of quotes from from Kafka and Rothbard, which might initially not seem to have much to do with each other, but I think there is an important connection. So Kafka says that people were, were offered the choice between being kings and being royal envoys. Like children, they all wanted to be envoys. That is why there are so many envoys chasing through the world, shouting for the want of kings, the most idiotic messages to one another. Now, so you might think this doesn't have much to do with the Rothbard quote, but I think it does. It's another example of this idea in Kafka of authority as being simultaneously omnipresent, yet elusively absent and indefinitely deferred. Um, the envoys are supposed to be representatives of some authority, but the authority is never is nowhere to be seen. It's all just the envoys. Um, and I think that that connects with this Rothbard quote. A tyrant is but one person and could scarcely command the obedience of another person, much less of an entire country, if most of the subjects did not grant their obedience by their own consent. Every tyranny must necessarily be grounded upon general popular acceptance, which of course is an idea that goes back to Etienne de la Boetti, um, whose book Rothbard famously wrote an intro for, um, and also explained that it's to be pronounced Labueti and not Laboisi, given when and where uh, the dude was from. Also, it's a theme in Hume and a theme in William Godwin, although those three thinkers all go different directions with it. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I think that once again, this idea is that. It's not the tyrant, it's not the king who controls things. Whether there's actually a king or not, that's not what controls things. It's the people who are, who are the representatives of the king, the people who follow the king. They're the ones who are responsible for the government's power. The king's just one guy, he's not responsible for it. It's all the, you know, all the royal envoys from Kafka's point of view. So that's what I see as the connection between these 
two quotations, even if initially they don't seem as if they're on the same topic. I think there's a connection. Um, then there's another passage uh, where uh, K, who is the um, uh, the hero of uh, well, hero. I don't know. Hero is the right the right word. He's the central character of the trial, um, and uh, he complains behind all the actions of this court of justice. There's a great organization at work, which not only employs corrupt warders and stupid inspectors, but also has at its disposal a judicial hierarchy with an indispensable and numerous retinue of servants, clerks, police, and other assistants, perhaps even hangmen. Um, and that irresistibly reminded me of this quotation from Mises. Government is in the last resort, the employment of armed men, of policemen, gendarmes, soldiers, prison guards, and hangmen. You know, so Kafka saying, you know, all this stuff where the court of justice seems so, um, seems so august and magisterial, but really it's just a cover for, uh, you know, this army of, uh, of people who are using force. And presumably those would be the same people as, you know, all the people who wanted to be royal envoys uh, uh, in the previous quotation. Um, uh, and then when Kafka is, uh, when K is, is protesting that he is innocent, he's been arrested, he's innocent. And there's a big dispute among interpreters of the trial as to whether K is really innocent or not. Of course, I think that that hooks up with this theological versus political interpretation. You know, on the theological reading, he is not innocent. We are all fallen. Uh, and so he you know, deserves this, all this stuff that's happening to him. Uh, on the political reading, the things that are happening to him are not justified and he is innocent. That's my reading. Anyway, so someone says to him, the high authorities we serve before they would order such an arrest as this must be quite well informed about the reasons. That is the law. How could there be a mistake in that? And Kay replies, I don't know this law and it probably exists nowhere but in your own head. You know, so one of the themes of of Kafka's later writings uh, is that this authority that people appeal to uh, is elusive, mysterious. It's not clear it's really there. People, lots of people are rep are putting themselves forward as representatives of it. If you try to get your hands on it, it's elusive. Which again, that could probably connects to the story about the the guy arguing with the doorkeeper to the law. Um, this door exists only for you, but I won't let you in. Oh. If he had gotten in, who knows what he would have found on the other side. Uh, was the law really there, shining in his majesty? You know, there's some suggestions that there was something glowing and beautiful behind the door that you couldn't get to. I think that might be the theological reading. On the political reading, maybe there's jack shit behind the door. Um, uh, and Kay finds that the spectators in the courtroom who have seized him from behind the collar and stretched out their arms to block his way are all wearing badges of various sizes and colors. They were all colleagues, these ostensible parties of the right and the left. Every man jack of you is an official, I see. You are yourselves the corrupt agents of whom I have been speaking. So it's not just the officials of the court, but the spectators who are all part of the power system, even though they're all supposed to be on different political parties uh, and they're supposed to be spectators, not officials. They are all part of what sustained the power system. Then in uh, the the uh, the other of his two major novels. Oh, he has he has three novels. Uh, the the trial and and the castle is usually regarded as his two major ones. Um, the third one's called either America or the man who disappeared. Though in German it's just like the disappeared or the disappeared one because he liked these short titles. The trial, the castle, the disappeared, but the disappeared looks odd in English. Um, so it's usually given either as the man who disappeared or as America, because he seems to have played around with giving it that title too. But anyway, the, you know, the, the, the trial and the castle have gotten a lot more attention than America. Um, though America is, you know, it, well, he didn't finish America. I mean, in a sense which he didn't really finish any of them, but um, the other two are more finished than America is. Uh, but anyway, so in, in the castle, it's the castle that represents this authority. And of course, there's partly an inspiration from Prague Castle, this castle looming above the town. Uh, although 
uh, Kafka himself actually lived for a while on the grounds of Prague Castle. Um, and you can go and visit his uh, uh, his little apartment there um, in the uh, in the Golden Lane in Prague Castle um, now, and you know, can buy postcards. Um, but in the you know in the castle, the main character who once again is named K. Uh, cannot manage to get to the castle. The castle is the authority he cannot get in touch with. He keeps trying to get there. Um, and it's never even, even clear whether the castle is even inhabited. The castle's veiled in mist and darkness without even a glimmer of light to show that the castle was there in the illusory emptiness above him. Never yet had Kay seen there the slightest sign of life. The gaze of the observer could not remain concentrated there, but slid away. The longer he looked, the less he could make out, and the deeper everything was lost in the twilight. Of course, theologically, you can interpret this as meaning, you know, you never get positive evidence for the existence of God, but nevertheless, Kafka's solution does not seem to be a, re a rejection of religious faith. Um, but at the political level, uh, you know, I think the moral is, is the reverse, that there's a kind of hollowness or emptiness to uh, political authority. Uh, there's really nothing there. Um, and one point he's told, all those contacts of yours, he thinks he's had various contacts with people from the castle. All these contacts have been illusory. There's no fixed connection with the castle, no central exchange which transmits our calls further. There is no difference between the peasantry and the castle. Um, you know, so I think this is another way of saying, maybe the authority, you know, the authority is just everyone, everyone acting as though there's an authority. That's what creates the authority. Uh, kind of like Gustav Landauer's uh, line that the state is a pattern of interaction among people and you abolish the state just by interacting differently. Um, I think that may be what Kafka is getting at here. Uh, then in his, in his essay, well, essay, short story, it's not clear what it is. Um, in his work, in his short work, The Great Wall of China, uh, uh, he has the, um, you know, he has these people supposedly uh, resident in China saying this, although a lot of it seems really to be more about residents of Prague. Um, so vast is our residents of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So vast is our land that no fable could do justice to its vastness. The heavens can scarcely span it and Peking is only a dot in it and the Imperial Palace less than a dot. Although we are, we are always trying to get information about the emperor, it is almost impossible to discover anything. We do not know what emperor is reigning or even the name of the dynasty. Any tidings, even if they did reach us, would arrive far too late, would have become obsolete long before they reached us. If from such appearances anyone should draw the conclusion that we have no emperor, he would not be far from the truth. Now, of course, as you know, we're taking this literally, of course, said Kafka as a citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Emperor, Austro-Hungarian Empire, knew exactly who the emperor was, and it wasn't it's not that far from uh, from um, from Prague to Vienna. Or wherever the emperor was at the moment, um, to uh, to get there, uh, it's like a four or five hour train ride, which I've taken uh, from Vienna to Prague, from Prague to Vienna and back. Very pleasant. Um, uh, but anyway, um, but again, I think the idea is that again questioning whether this authority really exists or really is a genuine uh, authority. Um, and then, you know, just as uh, you know, he's got this this short little story that's sort of embedded in, uh, in the trial. There's a little other little, other little story called the Imperial Message, uh, which uh, which is also adapted in that comic book, uh, where the dying emperor is sending a message to you, uh, and so the messenger uh, is trying to get his his way there. He's trying to fight his way through the imperial court, um, but the multitudes are so vast; their numbers have no end. If it could reach the open fields, how fast he would fly. Doubtlessly, you would soon hear the welcome hammering of his fists on your door. Instead, how vainly does he wear out his strength, and still he is only making his way through the chambers of the innermost palace. Never will he get to the end of them. And if he succeeded in that, nothing would be gained. He must fight his way down on the next stair. And if he succeeded in that, nothing would be gained. The courts still have to be crossed. And after the courts, the second outer palace, and once more stairs and courts, and once more another palace, and so on for thousands of years. Um, this might remind you of Zeno's paradoxes of motion. And so the, you know, the emperor can never get to you. The emperor's message, if the emperor's got a message, 
it can never reach you. Um, you know, again, there's sort of theological worries about the silence of God, but also this question about, you know, is there any real political authority? And yet subjects are commanded, uh, you know, back in the Great Wall of China, again, subjects are commanded to leave our homes, the stream with its bridges, our mothers and fathers, our weeping wives, our children who needed our care, and depart for the distant city to be trained there, to build a protective wall against barbarians whom no one has ever seen except in the books of the ancients, with gaping mouths and great pointed teeth. In other words, sort of an imaginary uh, or imaginarily uh, scary enemy, um, and of course, this was this uh, this story was written in 1917 at a point when checks were being sent by a distant imperial capital to fight for poorly understood reasons against foreigners with whom they had no quarrel, and so this seems like it's a kind of a comment on the First World War. Uh, here's another one of these sort of elusive, um, elusive authority uh, stories. This is from, from, I don't know whether to call this a short story or an essay or what the heck it is. Um, a lot of Kafka's work sort of defy literary categorization in the same way that some of, of topics do as well. Our laws are not generally known to us. They are kept secret by the small group of nobles who rule us. The laws were made to the advantage of the nobles from the very beginning. They themselves stand above the laws. The very existence of these laws is at most a matter of presumption. Some say the law is whatever the nobles do and see everywhere only the arbitrary acts of the nobility. While others hope that one day everything will have become clear. The law will belong to the people and the nobility will vanish. But nobody would dare to repudiate the nobility and thereby deprive ourselves of the sole visible and indubitable law. So there's this idea that the, the rulers uh, claim to be representing some law. We can never quite get our hands on what it's supposed to be, but we have this kind of respect for the law, whatever the heck it's supposed to be, such that even if we have doubts about whether they really represent it, we don't dare overthrow them because they are you know, the closest we can get access to uh, the law. Uh, okay, well, before going on to Hashek, I want to, which I'll probably do in the next video, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, I want to supplement these slides with you know, some material that I have drawn from the unfinished written version of uh, this talk. And uh, um, so here's a little bit more from the Great Wall of China. Uh, you know, Perhaps the, you know, they're, they're worrying, wondering about whether the emperor really exists or not, and if so, what he's doing. Is he reclining in luxury there, or is he on his deathbed? How should we know anything about that thousands of miles away in the south? The government has not yet succeeded in developing the institution of the empire to such precision that its workings extend directly and unceasingly to the farthest frontiers of the land. You know, hence, the only emperor that the people know anything about is the emperor as such, who is mighty throughout all the hierarchies of the world. In other words, sort of the ideal or imaginary emperor. But as for the existent emperor, in other words, the actual human being who supposedly occupies that role, we would think about him if we knew who he was or knew anything definite about him. Um, yet they never are able to find out anything about him. They never find out anything about what really goes on in the imperial capital. Like tardy arrivals, like strangers in the city, they stand at the end of some densely thronged side street, peacefully munching. Uh, well, far away in front, at the heart of the city, the emperor perhaps totters and falls from his throne. So again, there's this alien, this elusive alienation of authority. Uh, you know, the authority that supposed the distant ideal authority that's supposedly represented by the local authorities. It's not clear whether there's any connection. Um, uh, a few years later, Kafka wrote uh, a kind of follow-up to the Great Wall of China called The Refusal, in which he re returns to something like the same vision of an empire. It's not clear whether it's the same empire as in the Great Wall of China or just something similar. The, the scene is set in a village he describes as being so far from the frontier across wild fertile plains and desolate highlands that no one from our town has ever been there. And to imagine even part of the road makes one tired. Yet even further than the frontier is the capital. For while we do get news of the frontier wars now and again, of the capital, we learn next to nothing. 
In this distant capital, great rulers have superseded each other and dynasties have been deposed or annihilated. And even the capital itself was destroyed and a new one founded far away from it before being destroyed in its turn and the old one rebuilt. Yet none of this had any influence on our little town. And soldiers of the empire do sometimes pass through the village. Uh, and from Kafka's description of them, these soldiers of the empire supposed, seem to be the same people as the scary Northern barbarians against which the empire was supposedly protecting people on the Great Wall of China. The narrator of the refusal says he is constantly being surprised by the way we in our town humbly submit to all orders issued in the capital. But as he portrays it, the town is actually run by an aging colonel who holds the office of chief tax collector. And Kafka says, he has never produced a document entitling him to this position and likely does not possess such a thing. Moreover, even if he really is chief tax collector, no one is quite sure why this has taken him to entitled taken to entitle him to rule over all other departments in the administration as well. One is almost under the impression that the people here say, now that you've taken all we possess, please take us as well. Yet it was not he who seized the power, nor is he a tyrant. Rather, it has simply come about over the years that the chief tax collector is automatically a top official, and the colonel accepts the tradition just as we do. From time to time, the townspeople petition this official for a year's tax exemption or a subsidy because the poorest quarter of the town had been burned to the ground. Well, it does happen now and again that minor petitions are granted. Nevertheless, in all important matters, the citizens can always count on a refusal. And even when a petition is granted, it invariably looks as though the colonel had done it as a powerful private person on his own responsibility and it had to be kept all but a secret from the government. Yet the colonel's eyes, as far as we know, are also the eyes of the government though there is a difference which is, which is impossible to comprehend completely. Uh, you know, so there's some kind of, um, uh, there's something puzzling going on there. Um, uh, yeah, once again, this, uh, the unclarity of the connection between the local authorities you actually have to deal with and this ideal authority that they supposedly uh, represent uh, in the trial, we also get this uh, claim that it's, that it's pointless for an attorney's client to suggest reforms in the legal system, since any benefit arising from that would profit clients in the future only, while one's own interests would be immeasurably injured by attracting the attention of vengeful officials. There's kind of a, you know, a public choice problem there. Uh, and then Kay, the protagonist of the trial, although he's the victim of bureaucracy, He's a kind of bureaucrat himself, and he treats his own clients in much the same way that higher officials treat him. So as an anxious client is pleading his case before Kay, we're told that Kay soon ceased to listen and merely nodded now and then and confined himself to staring at the other's bald head bent over the papers and asking himself when the fellow would begin to realize that all his eloquence was being wasted. It's difficult, said Kay, pursing his lips. But Kay doesn't seem to recognize, it doesn't show any sign of recognizing the similarity between the way he's treating his clients and the way he's been treated by the bureaucrats above him. That's why I don't think it's the protagonist is quite the right term for him, or hero certainly is not. Uh, you know, and, and Kay is warned by one source that it sometimes happened that the first plea was not read by the court at all, but simply filed or even mislaid or lost altogether. But another source tells him no document is ever lost. The court never forgets anything. So that an acquittal may be reversed at any time if some official happens to take up the documents and recognize that in this case, the charge is still valid. You know, so we've got, you know, we've got sort of two visions of government, of government bureaucracy here. here. There, there's the incompetent, government bureaucracy is incompetent where they just lose the thing of stuff. And there's government bureaucracy as this all pervading surveillance um, and, uh, you know, and Kafka is sort of um, dramatizing both of those things. Um, you know, and of course, those, those are sort of different, different ways of conceiving of criticisms of bureaucracy. Um, uh, now, here's this the passage from uh, Rebecca West that I mentioned. As an inhabitant of the Habsburg Empire, Kafka had great reason to feel gratitude to its bureaucracy which did in fact protect the interests of most of the population and met nearly all eventualities. Yeah, as I said, I'm not convinced that that was Kafka's view. 
And West also thinks that Shakespeare was pro-monarchy. I'm not convinced of that either, although that's a, that's a very common view of Shakespeare, that monarchy represents the, the establishment of order, um, that bringing the proper monarch back is a reestablishment of order. I'm not convinced that that's the right interpretation of Shakespeare, but at least that, no, there's more support for that than I think this interpretation of Kafka. Um, uh, I have a bit here about the shift from Kafka's early writings where authority is a terrifying presence influenced by his father and that's in, our, in short stories like The Judgment and Metamorphosis to authority as an absence or an indefinite deferral which I think is what's going on in the trial in the castle on the Great Wall of China um, which I think connects to sort of the anarchist criticism of this idea of a final arbiter that the Randians believe in uh, where the anarchists argue that there's no such thing as a final arbiter there can never be a final arbiter that's not how society works um, uh, or Wittgenstein's idea that you know, that people are looking for a self-applying rule and you can't have one, which is something I published on um, uh, in the um, in the Prague Journal of Political Economy. Uh, I'll have a link to that in the description. Also, Daniel Dennett, who I, I rarely cite favorably, but uh, I think on this point he's correct that. Um, when people think about the way the brain works, they think of there being some place in the brain where it all comes together. Um, uh, I like this little person inside the brain. Um, and he says, no, that's not how it works. So that you get this interaction of parts of the brain, but there's no central authority um, in the brain. Uh, you know, there's also this, um, this nice line from his Tsurao aphorisms. The animal twists the whip out of its master's grip and whips itself to become its own master, not knowing that this is only a fantasy produced by a new knot in the master's whiplash. And that sounds like something out of Foucault. What you take as, as liberation is just a new form of domination. Um, and then uh, in, his, uh, in the novel was called either America or the man who disappeared. Um, there's this case uh, where this, um, uh, this elevator boy who's supposed to be monitoring the elevators, uh, this acquaintance of his shows up drunken and vomiting. And so he you know, has to hustle him away out there, but it's sort of a dilemma because if he doesn't hustle him away, he'll be blamed for letting his drunken vomiting friends stay there. But if he does hustle him away, he'll be, you know, he'll be get in trouble for abandoning his post. You know, so he decides to hustle him away and sure enough, he gets accused of abandoning his post. When he tries to explain, uh, you know, everything is, you know, he, um, uh, everything is, not, you know, he, people refuse to listen to him on the grounds that how can you possibly take seriously the, you know, the judgment of some elevator boy compared to his, his superiors? The superiors are more to be trusted than some elevator boy. So there's a connection of, of class here too. In fact, the, um, the movie version of, uh, of this book is called Class Relations. Um, uh, and in fact, I have another piece on that, which is, you know, it's not completely complete, but it's, it's much more written up. Uh, it's a piece on the idea of the problem of other minds as a political problem um, in Shakespeare's Othello and William Godwin's novel, Caleb Williams, and in uh, Kafka's novel, America. And I'll have a link to that in the description. Anyway, here's a, uh, here's a quotation from that, uh, from, uh, from Kafka's uh, final novel, America. Although he had worked here for two months as well as he could, and certainly better than many of the other boys, he had to recognize that such considerations were taken into account at the decisive moment in no part of the world, neither in Europe nor in America. The verdict was determined by the first words that happened to fall from the judge's lips in an impulse of fury. So here's sort of a complete skepticism about the objectivity of both of the legal system politically and of the employer employee uh, system. And also this is the fact that no one will take seriously the, um, uh, you know, what the, um, what the employee says is another example of this, this principle that information doesn't travel well in hierarchies, uh, which is something as I said before that both Robert Anton Wilson and Kevin Carson have made a, uh, a big deal of. Uh, so I think I'm going to uh, snip this here as well and make the, the final part on Yaroslav Hasek. 
uh, a separate part three. Um, so uh, until next time, um, like, share, subscribe, consider supporting on uh, Patreon and Pay PayPal if you're so inclined, and I'll see you next time.